Okay, what I'd like to do today is to take three giant steps back and try to uh, place the issues that you've been grappling with this semester in a broad conceptual and historical framework. And I'll also like to scan various possibilities for the future with the, with the hopes of shedding further light on the challenges before us and to, if, with any luck, stimulate some discussion on what we need to do and how we need to be. For it seems that we live in an extraordinary moment in the 4.5 billion year history of this planet. Some kind of global society is taking shape. But its outcome is profoundly uncertain. Now I find that many people find it frighteningly easy to envision very dark futures of, of impoverished people and culture and nature. As a matter of fact, many people seem to think that's the business as usual scenario. Uh, I'm often reminded in having discussions like this of the words of the uh, existential philosopher Woody Allen who once uh, said, like no other time in history, humanity is at a crossroads. And one path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other path leads to total destruction. <laughs> may we have the courage to choose wisely. But I think we do what we do, and I think you're here because we think there's other possibilities, and that while it may seem highly improbable, that a transition to a world of enriched lives and human solidarity and a healthy planet is still possible. And that's the subject of a recent essay uh, the, of the Global Scenario Group. Let me tell you just a few words about the Global Scenario Group. Go Global Scenario Group was formed in 1995. It was convened by the Stockholm Environment Institute to provide a forum for a fairly diverse international group of people to consider the possibilities and to analyze the possibilities for a sustainable world. The research of the Global Scenario Group has been picked up by numerous uh, global assessments on various aspects, whether it be energy, water, land, agriculture, and so on. And in particular was the uh, foundation for the scenario chapter of the GEO report that I guess you must have come across in this course. Uh, I am not going to burden you with the technical details today. If you're curious, you can download this essay. I also brought a copy, so if any, to be a door prize, whoever asks the most friendly question. But the, uh, some of the technical reports to back up, you know, some of the numbers and the modeling and so on will be found at, at this website if you want to dig uh, a little deeper. So transitions are everywhere in nature. Many different systems evolve gradually, then enter a period of rapid change, and eventually emerge in a new state of quasi-stability. And we can track change from the stages of takeoff, acceleration, and stabilization. But with the emergence of proto-humans, a powerful new factor, cultural development, accelerated change on the planet, and brought a new kind of transition between the phases of human history. Now, of course, there are no sharp demarcations. Uh, history is a, a messy business. But with a long view, we can see two great macro transformations in the history of modern man. Stone Age culture lasted about 100,000 years before early civilization arose roughly 10,000 years ago. And early civilization, in turn, gave way to the modern era over the last millennium. Now, our, our assertion now is that we are in the midst of a third great transition to what we call the planetary phase of civilization. And we seem to be about there. Now, note that if this were to occur over roughly 100 years, and I think that's not an unreasonable hypothesis, that a pattern of historic acceleration would continue. And we can see that by switching to a logarithmic scale for the time axis. 
Now in this long process, the complexity of society increased along many different dimensions. I mean, for example, social organization moved from the level of the tribe to the city-state to the nation to the planet. And the economic basis from hunting and gathering to settled agriculture, industrial capitalism, and the globalizing economy of our own time. Communication from the evolution of language, to writing, printing, and the modern information revolution. But the defining feature of the planetary transition is increasing global connectivity. And there were many early expressions of this. For example, the formation of the United Nations. Or on a more symbolic level, the Apollo mission that first transmitted back that iconic vision of our, our fragile blue planet afloat in the cosmos that became everybody's logo. But the real takeoff, I think, was over the last couple of decades. And the signals included environmental change at the scale of the biosphere, the revolution in information and communications technology that is shrinking our world, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the increasing hegemony of global capitalism, the emergence of new actors such as the World Trade Organization, multinational corporation, and the appearance of a new global species, which I call Davos Man. At the same time, there was the Earth Summit and the emergence of globally linked civil society as a force in world affairs and the appearance of a new species of global skeptic, the Seattle woman. But we should also mention here global terrorism because fundamentalist reaction, I think, is also part of the story of global transition. So as these various trends and driving forces unfold and, and interact with new factors and behaviors and contingencies, the global trajectory can branch into fundamentally uh, different directions. The question is, is there a way of organizing this evolution towards a sustainable, just, and desirable future? Now, the word sustainable development is in everyone's lexicon these days, but it probably has as many meanings as people who use it. But one thing it tends to mean to most people is the idea of passing on an undiminished world to the future. So it becomes then a question of moral and scientific imperative to study the future. Right? If you care about sustainability, you've got to find out what actions now are going to get us on the right track so it's compatible with those normative directions. So over the last 20 years, a new scientific discipline has emerged to consider properties, dynamics, possibilities of the future. Prior to that, that was the realm of the, you know, the mystics, the seers, the poets, and the futurists, and Herman Kahn, if you know who he is. Um, <coughs> so, um, how, how can you think about the future in an organized way? This is a tremendously challenging methodological problem. Because we're not only needing to think about the future of a complex global system, but also a system 